Because after all, what is, is existentialism or humanism all about? It's about human lives, Absolutely. human existence. It's not about white man's existence or uh, this class's existence. And I, I felt for such a long time that, that the riches of this approach need to be opened up. The box needs to be opened up for, for everyone because this is a human project. Absolutely. The human project. How do we, re what is our relationship to life as a whole, to existence as a whole? We're all in that, as you say. Uh, you know, we're all vulnerable, fragile, small beings before this vastness. The messy aspects of our human experience, our feelings, our flesh, and our psyches can never conform to the prevalent culture of quick fixes. It seems that our technologies are speeding ahead of us. It appears as though we are trying to catch up but to no avail. So, are we going to turn into automatons absorbed by our screens? Or can we slow down, contemplate, cultivate an awareness of the unknown with humility and wonder? Welcome to the Soul Space Podcast. We're your hosts, Adrian and Thal. On this episode, we speak with Kirk Schneider, a psychologist and leader within the field of existential humanistic psychology. Kirk began exploring the fundamental questions of human existence at an early age, following the death of his brother. Kirk believes that one of the keys to human flourishing is through the cultivation of awe and presence, especially as we approach the AI and robotic revolution. Kirk offers his critique of mainstream cognitive behavioral therapy, and he advocates for an integrative model of psychotherapy, one that celebrates the messiness of life. Kirk was the editor of the Journal of Humanistic Psychology, and he's an adjunct faculty at Saybrook University, Teachers College at Columbia University, and the California Institute of Integral Studies. He has written many books, including The Paradoxical Self, Awakening to Awe, The Polarized Mind, and his latest book, The Spirituality of Awe. In 2004, he was presented the Rollo May Award from the American Psychological Association for his work in advancing humanistic psychology. It is our pleasure to bring you Kirk Schneider. We do have a starting question, and sure. we're wondering about um, the spiritual orientation of your childhood. <laughs> or if you had a spiritual orientation. Well, I was brought up Jewish. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm of Jewish descent. And uh, I, I really grew up in a pretty secular household. So there wasn't a lot of attention. There's very minimal attention to ceremony mm -hmm. or religion even. Um, my father was pretty much... Uh, what, what you'd call an atheist, I would say, and my mother was had that leaning as well, and uh, they they certainly uh, appreciated the historical lineage of Judaism, but I, I would say especially the philosophers uh, like uh, Spinoza, mm -hmm. uh, to the degree that we all knew about these people. Um, Maimonides, I mean, Jewish philosophers who talked about life and raised questions about life. I think they appreciated the, uh, the spirit of inquiry in particular. The in mystical tradition. arm or the contemplative arms of, of the religion. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. I would say more the contemplative arms uh, they were they were pretty much products of the Enlightenment, especially my dad, 
who went on to become a, he was a uh, school teacher in math and science, and then he became a principal, and then he went on to uh, get his uh, doctorate in education. So he was a humanistic educator, mm. <laughs> and uh, very much aligned with the, the humanistic psychology uh, temper of the times. I grew up with uh, people like uh, Abraham Maslow and Frank Barron and Rollo May, uh, Carl Rogers, uh, surrounding me, uh, mm-hmm. even in my playroom. I, I would use some of their their textbooks as building blocks <laughs> 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 to build uh, cities. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I remember from a very young age uh, being surrounded by that kind of uh, thinking. Mm-hmm. But I, I had a very unique upbringing in that uh, I grew up in a uh, Italian Catholic German neighborhood, working class neighborhood in the Cleveland area. And so I, uh, I really got to know uh, those traditions in a very earthy way as a kid. I mean, I'd, I'd spend time for Christmas uh, with uh, friends across the street, and um, I got to know uh, some about the traditions, uh, some of the prejudices, too. We, mm-hmm. we definitely uh, were impacted by that. Um, one one day I woke up to find uh, a giant Nazi sign painted on our ping pong table that was hanging in our garage that made a huge impression mm. um, and I, I got caught up in uh, some of the uh, prejudices of the, the time too as a little kid you know, it's kind of joining other mobs of kids uh, and one incident I remember in particular was my father pulling me out of that mob and I was probably the only time that I remember him hitting me, but he Mm. uh, hit me pretty good on the butt and uh, then sat me down and explained the seriousness of uh, what I was involved in and how hurtful that is, could be to other kids. um, Mm -hmm. Just more about having sensitivity for people as human beings made a huge impression. I, uh, like, I hear you when you talk about that. Just uh, for me, um, I remember 9-11 was a big um, event where I went into an identity crisis after as a, as a Muslim woman in the West. And, mm-hmm. um, and realizing that maybe the dark side of religions mm-hmm. is the, div- like, the divisions that it creates. And it's an it's it's a paradox because similarly they do have they all have the mystical arms, the Sufism, Kabbalah, and they're all yes. they're all connected, and and they're in many ways doorways to experience the divine. But it's mm. we have to overcome the divisions to 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 arrive there. I, I think I feel. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I'm I'm sorry to hear about the uh, challenges that you went through. I'm sorry to hear about your challenges as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was some, some difficult times. Mm-hmm. But, uh, uh, I agree with uh, what what I hear you saying about, I, I think one of the great problems of traditional religion, or actually one of the great challenges of traditional religions is that they all point eventually to the deconstruction of religion. That is, religious boundaries around human beings or boundaries that make certain human beings uh, seen in a certain way and others in another way, the whole Mm -hmm. us-them tension, when most of the great religions are about, in their essence, it seems to me, you know, embracing the stranger, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. Being humane to each other. Absolutely, yep. Walking yep. humbly before the uh, vastness of creation. Mm-hmm. They call it God. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
but they they can do tremendous good in that way. And we have had some interpreters of religion, I'm thinking of Gandhi and King, for example, who uh, exhibited that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rumi comes to mind as well, from my limited knowledge of, of his, his poetry, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. There definitely needs to be a revival of, of the, the mystical um, I think so. Yeah, more like. Although I, I, I think sometimes mysticism can also become dogmatic in its own right at times too. When it's anything like, can become dogmatic I mean, once humans start putting their hands in on yeah, it. I, I think. It's crazier. That's why I call it's myself. It's us humans. <laughs> it's very human. It is very human, and it's a human challenge. Right. But uh, it is why I call myself an enchanted agnostic. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. If you want to know my religiosity, that's it. I, I take mystery very seriously. I love that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very uh, exhilarated mm -hmm. by the notion, the experience of mystery. Mm -hmm. it, to me, it helps to, to lift us out of the petty and narrow identifications that we so often get into, both toward ourselves and others. Yes. And we, we forget that we're participating in something much, much greater and incredible. I mean, I call it awesome. <laughs> you know, so. Kirk, you shared Kirk, with you us share. um, just the challenges of getting involved in the, the mob behavior early on as a kid. Um, yeah. I'm trying to connect some of the dots there in, in terms of how, how do those early experiences lead you towards a path within psychology and more specifically existentialism? You know, your, your, your interest in... Um, essentially, what drew you towards that that area of, of human psychology? Yeah, well, it was certainly partly that uh, uh, challenge, that struggle of growing up, feeling uh, somewhat alienated, but also crossing bridges with other kids and feeling a part of... Uh, different cultures, people from di different backgrounds, uh, and all that stirred in me, as well as the teachings, I would say, uh, that uh, my dad communicated, my, my mother as well was very, very bright and uh, thoughtful, uh, and so a lot uh, revolved around discussion, but I would say... Uh, Maybe even more pivotal was the death of my brother when I was about three years old. Uh, he died of a convergence of illnesses, and uh, my parents did everything they could to save him. He was only seven at the time. And uh, that pretty much shattered our, our world uh, for a period of time. And... It caused a great deal of uh, emotional turmoil among all of us. Uh, I don't know if uh, I would say particularly me, but I mean myself. And in, in terms of being such a young, you know, impressionable child, I, I I was very lost and actually very terrified of, of the world and of uh, death and of illness. Um, I, I would have night terrors where I would see witches and monsters at my window at night, I remember. I would go through uh, these long periods of, of crying, uh, long periods of temper tantrums too. One point, uh, I believe I... I kicked my mother's tooth out wow. in a rage and I, I was losing touch uh, kind of losing touch with uh, reality in some ways uh, I know my father even kept notes on me, he was con so concerned anyway, it was my mother however, who was most in touch with psychoanalysis, interestingly mm -hmm. and she was going through it herself after the loss of her son, which I, I, I can't even, it's almost, can't begin to imagine 
what she was going through with that. But she referred me to a child analyst. And so I became a patient at a very young age. I, I was about five years old, I believe. Mm. And I saw this guy, middle-aged guy, for about a year. And it was probably one of the most important contacts in my life and certainly formative in my move toward not just thinking about being interested in human behavior, but, you know, really living it and feeling it. And uh, I think one of the most important parts of that work is I, I don't remember a thing that we said, really. I, I just what I remember is his very calm and uh, powerful presence, really. Right? And, and the feeling that he had been through a lot himself. He didn't reveal anything about his background, as far as I know, verbally, but non-verbally, he felt very seasoned to me. It felt like he could hold me, and that's what I really needed. I needed a holding that, at that time, was very difficult for my own parents to do because of their own turmoil. And uh, anyway, that started me on a path toward... Um, being able to, to, in a sense, gradually move from a place of, of kind of abject terror and paralysis to gradual risk-taking with him and expressing my feelings, and being able to verbalize what I was going through to the degree I could at that age, uh, and, uh, and even intrigue uh, about life and, and these questions that terrified me before, these were huge questions I was opened up to at a very young age about what the hell's the meaning of all this? Uh, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my parents? Uh, what is death? What is life? You know, how do we live it? These started becoming more and more intriguing questions to me uh, as I was able to kind of work with such scary places in myself. And I think that really was the beginning. That was my introduction to existentialism in a lot of ways. My world being ripped open. And, and what an apt uh, introduction, because um, as you're describing your experience, I'm, I'm just thinking about a lot of adults really out there that are in in fear and are paralyzed by fear and are unable to to experience um, awe in their life, um, which is I, I don't even know how to f like if I'm going to frame a question, but maybe just to hear your thoughts around that. My thoughts are that there, there are in some ways there are two ways to to look at that space that gets ripped open. Mm -hmm. You know, the the. Uh, the safe, the, the safe in a sense, the safe and familiar, getting ripped open to the the, the radically uh, unknown, uh, the boundaryless, because you don't have any guideposts at that point. You're in a free fall. That can be seen as totally horrifying and floundering, but I think through good psychotherapy, especially a depth psychotherapy that is not just talking about, but meeting the person with their whole body experience, can begin to uh, allow more of a sense of awe, more of a sense of wonder about that space. Because you remember that the very space that feels terrifying and overwhelming and boundaryless is also a space that's potentially very freeing, <laughs> you know, and, and can enable your imagination, your creativity, uh, more of a, a self-creation in a sense or a communal creation. It, it allows... The freedom that 
the, the safe and familiar or the narrow path uh, does often does not permit. Now, which one is better, quote unquote? You know, this is a, a struggle for everyone or a question for everyone. But for me, that was very important. In a sense, I guess, my postmodern awakening that, you know, or philosophical awakening that so much of our world is constructed, constructed by people. And if you can hold that uh, kind of hold that uh, tentativeness about how we're programmed and how we're conditioned, you, you can begin to expand and, and deepen. If yeah. you have help, but help is huge. Yes. So I don't yes. want to discount that. I, and I think that's to speak to, to your question there is, uh, in terms of how does one move in this direction? We, we need helpful witnesses, as Alice Miller put it whether they're therapists, neighbors, you know, clergy, parents, uh, friends, or you know, thinking of Maya Angelou, the great poet, found it in books. Yes, she went to yes. her local library following a horribly traumatic uh, sexual abuse that she went through. But she found heroes and people who related to her through literature, so it can happen in different ways. But it's so crucial that we have those that help along the way. Yeah, th this is so interesting because it's not just, we're not just talking about these concepts, like philosophical concepts, you know, yeah, you, there's a practice of this. And that to me with the existential therapy is the bridging of that into a real practical level. Um, but for a lot of people, I, I, I have the sense that they might not know what that what that looks like. Um, would you be able to describe what that might actually look like in terms of working with somebody in a depth oriented manner and connecting with the, sort of their existential um, uh, aspects of being? Sure. I just want to add that I, I feel extremely uh, blessed to have had this kind of help along the way and, uh, again something not to be skipped over mm -hmm. and i had a similar pivotal experience or time uh, around graduate school around when i was 21 or so very far from home and had a kind of uh, anxiety panic attack breakdown that uh, I received uh, pivotal help uh, for by a local uh, existential uh, depth therapist at the time. So these these really were my formative, uh, probably most, most core uh, bases for my direction and informing my direction. Uh, and then I had some great mentors too, which we can get into later if we want to, but uh, I guess we're, we're talking about, again, being able to have that kind of support. So- uh, Thank you, yeah, thank you for going and mentioning it because it is, it is important. I mean, I even can, I'm, I'm even grateful that I'm able to get um, the depth uh, psychotherapy that I'm going through. I've been going through Jungian analysis now for two years, and I already oh. see the benefits of that. So, yes, it is important to to mention that maybe not everyone, you know, has that opportunity. Um, That's right. Yeah. But everyone who goes into this field should, in my view, mm -hmm. really. I mean, if if you you're not taking that trip yourself, I think it's very hard to be there uh, in an optimal way for the other person. Very true. Or, or if, at least in some way that you haven't done that kind of down and dirty you know, uh, encounter with your own uh, blocked off places. It's, it's hard to, to support 
uh, actually doing the work. But in terms of your other question about the uh, the approach, I guess we're getting more into the theory at this point. Um, I really see uh, what I call existential integrative therapy as um, as formed around two basic questions. Now, these are mainly implicit questions in the encounter, but sometimes they're explicit. Those questions are, how is one presently living? So it's, it's, it's like holding the mirror to that partner or client to help them to see as close up as possible for them, how are they living right now? What is the state of their, their union in a sense, what, or disunion? And not just intellectually or not just behaviorally on the outside, but with their whole body experience to the degree possible. And this is the integrative part, the degree possible that client's desire and capacity for deeper change is a very important piece of this. And not everybody has the desire or the capacity to look, let's say, beyond symptoms or symptom change or just getting back to work or whatever. Or they're, they're so fragile that they maybe just need something physiological to help them through, whether that's... Um, medication, which I have a whole lot of skepticism around, but I also am open to as a possibility for many people just to get through the night um, or to have a base of life. So how are they presently living? And the second question is, then how are you willing to live? After you've looked inside you know, with as few uh, sort of consolations as possible, really tr attempting to see the starkness of where you're at. And what does that imply for how you're willing to live your life? So those really address the kind of the basic philosophical questions of freedom and responsibility existential questions. You have the freedom to explore and to look at what's going on. But we also have the freedom and responsibility, ability to respond to what we all have discovered. And so I actually call it freedom, experiential reflection, and responsibility. Because it's not just, I have questions about uh, just simply moving from uh, recognizing what's going on to just kind of instantly changing. It often takes you know, kind of a whole body awareness of what's going on before one has a deep sense of how one wants to change, you know, as opposed to just a cognitive conditioning for many people, not for everyone. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, how does one overcome the inertia or the stuckness that um, you might experience in terms of, you mentioned freedom, but sometimes freedom is paralyzing because there's so many choices, you know, which what? job do I take? You know, do I want to continue this relationship or end it? Um, and so how do, how does one work to the point where they actually activate themselves to, to begin the steps of change? Well, I, I see the therapy as, uh, helping the person again, seeing closer and closer, uh, into the mirror of themselves as to how they're living and how they're willing to live. And for those who are willing to take the, the deeper uh, journey with this therapy, uh, that mirror and that in intensifying of 
seeing where they are and where they want to be, and not only want to be, but emergingly are willing to be, is the impetus for many people. So it builds a kind of counter will, as Otto Rank put it, uh, or a frustration, as some of the Gestaltists put it. Uh, as as you, you you're very rarely exposed to that kind of uh, that intensity of frustration about um, the state of your life, and this is a, a very uh, exceptional space for one to keep coming back to, and again a very focused and present way, and revisiting of where it is you are, which is usually blocked, that's a part of your battle, you're blocked in some way, and where it is you want to be, and not only want to be, but are willing to commit to be. And if you keep going over that terrain, I find that that builds that counter will for many people to the point where they, they're not going to take it anymore. They're not going to keep living in that prison. You know, whether it's... Uh, drugs and alcohol, or uh, how they hold themselves back from uh, pursuing something that they deeply desire or are passionate about, a re love relationship, or maybe a project, art, work of some kind. Um, it, it's a very org organic process in that way. And so then once they can throw those blockades off. They can come into their fuller being. Again, more of their whole bodily experience. The fuller ranges of thoughts, feelings, sensations, imaginings, intuitions. And, dis and discover or connect with meanings that were latent before or dormant. But now... The person's will has been strengthened to the point where they can be pursued. I think it's, um, sorry, I think it's very important what you mentioned earlier, too, that the therapeutic alliance is not about the therapist only. It's also about what the person is coming with. Are they, are they willing to live a full life? Do they really want to go into the depths? It's not just about what the therapist um, does um, in that relationship. And it's also important what you said that um, overcoming those things then will, will, you know, take us to a place where there is meaning and which, which takes us back to that question, the meaning crisis. And, um, you know, nowadays, the, you know, in general, how we live our life is very mechanistic, very rigid, very in our head and, Really, this is about coming to life. And what I want to say is, is there is no fear in this work, I think. <laughs> Once we overcome and then, then awe comes in. <laughs> well, hopefully. Uh, Everybody should do some, this. <laughs> I, I, I agree with that. A lot, of, pretty, a lot of people, a lot more people right. would benefit from this journey. I mean, I, I feel... There's always a level of some anxiety, at least for me. Um, um, but I'm, I don't see that as bad. I just see that as human. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Flesh and blood and a certain vulnerability, uh, which is part of what intensifies and vivifies life. Uh, but, but the point being... Um, Yes, if you can come into that, um, you can feel a lot more vital about living, about possibilities, uh, and maybe even adopt a sense of awe toward living as a whole. So it's not just about necessarily pursuing certain goals or meanings but a whole attitude toward living uh, that uh, is, is freer, uh, that uh, a whole attitude of 
uh, being able to open to the amazement of, of that freedom. As you were saying before, it can be dizzying, it can be overwhelming, but the more you can be present to, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly within yourself and coexist with that and come into the more of who you are, the more that you can um, open to the amazement and the, the uh, really the miracle of this opportunity that we have of being a part of something that's so far beyond us. And that is very elevating. I'm not saying one can stay on that plane all the time or even that's necessarily desirable, but it certainly can be very powerful and very, very important antidote to depression. If we think about people like Viktor Frankl, for example, in the death camps, some people in the most dehumanizing conditions are able to connect with something much greater and themselves and their situations and through that find an impetus mm -hmm. to go on. Stephen Hawking, another example, with his ALS, but tuned into the cosmos, you know. That's or true. Actually, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, the work is not about um, getting rid of our anxieties and fears because those will never go away. It's about holding them with depth and um, uh, more spiritual maturity. I don't know. I'm limited by language. Um, but yeah, but, um, on a practical level, what's the difference between depth psychotherapy, depth existential psychotherapy and say, um, the more mainstream cognitive behavioral therapy? Well, I think the, the main difference is that, uh, we're, more concern with what you might call process as opposed to content. So it's not that the verbal isn't important. That's of course very important to helping someone to become more aware of their concerns and how they want to live in their lives. But probably even more important is uh, how they say what they say, what they bring to their words. In other words, how they hold themselves, their facial expressions, what the energy is like in the room between you. Um, it's, it's that cultivation of, of a fuller presence, I think, to what's really going on here as distinct from just helping somebody to move from one way of thinking to another way of thinking. Um, helping somebody change thoughts, you know, make thoughts more rational, if you will, which has all kinds of questions around it in itself. Rational for whom? You know? Yes, might help them function better in the world, in certain ways, but is that really to their benefit in a, in a deeper and fuller way? Um, like going back to the old job or the old relationship might be, you know, uh, adaptive in some ways, but maybe those are oppressive in a lot of ways and not really helping them or the culture in the longer run. So, yeah. Uh, this notion of uh, helping somebody to decide the direction of their lives in their deepest core rather than with some overlay of this is how you do it and this is what has been shown you know, through aggregate data that helps people. Yes, through one lens, I would say it's a narrow lens and narrow methodology often that can be helpful but there can be so much more and I think so many people are, are short changed from having that chance to stay more fully present 
with what is important to them. Uh, through you know some of the more programmatic therapies um, there, there's a lot around this uh, I mean another analogy here and this is a little bit crude but it, I think it makes the point is that sometimes what we're doing with cognitive and behavioral therapy is we're changing the, the window dressing on the Titanic Right. Okay, so you can make things prettier on the outside in a way, but are you really getting to what that person is struggling with at their core? And we've seen so many times where people's presenting problems may be something that seems more on the surface. They're not sleeping well, they're not eating well. Uh, one client who had assertiveness issues with their boss. Okay, so you help with that. But if those people stay with you for the longer journey or the deeper journey and are willing to uh, pay attention to what's going on in their bodies and what that brings up, what that associates with in their deeper being, uh, their presenting problems often shift to quite profound existential issues. Like, I don't want to just be assertive, more assertive at work. I want to live more free in my life. I want to feel more free as a person. I want to be able to express myself and access myself. And I've seen this happen a number of times with clients. Uh, or, uh, you know, I realize, uh, I mean, I'm not eating well or sleeping well. I, I'm in a, a, like a black hole in my life, a bottomless pit. Uh, I'm lost. Okay, so now we're getting to the deeper questions. And not, not just to think about them, but to try to be present to those places. As I say, to reoccupy parts of oneself that one has blocked off. And that's often nonverbal. You, you can't put that in words, as we were intimating before. You, you need to experience it. Yeah, I want to ask you, how, how do you personally maintain contact with that level of presence to allow for awe to even sort of be, be part of your experience? How do you, how do you approach that? Well, again, my therapies have been very important for me to feel less scared about a lot uh, and to be able to stay much more with myself, even when I'm feeling really down or pained or what have you, that is such a gift. I, I can't overemphasize that. To, to be able to be presented that opportunity to realign with your fuller being may be the greatest gift that one can be given. Because that means you can go into almost any circumstance and, and be okay, <laughs> relatively okay with yourself, relative friends with yourself. You've gotten to know yourself uh, in many more ways than just intellectual or what have you. So that has helped me tremendously. Um, I, I, I really try to practice being connected with something larger, uh, in, in my day-to-day -day life. I, I've had some recent struggles that have made that difficult, but also have made it more acute. Uh, I've recently developed a cervical dystonia, which is a neurological condition, which involves a twisting of the neck. It was extremely uh, tormenting at the beginning. Uh, it started with me just laying back in the bed and realizing that my head is slowly turning. And there's nothing I can do about it. And so I've, I've grappled with this for the last five years or so. And I have a neurologist. And I've managed to recruit a number of holistic people. And been working a lot on trying to address the physiology of it. But I think one of the most important things that has helped me, and I have improved notably, uh, has been 
a determination to fully live my life Mm -hmm. (laughs) in spite of or maybe even in light of it. And uh, I don't know, I I guess I've been blessed or cursed with sometimes uh, anger and frustration helping to to drive me on and and, and uh, help me feel more free because I, I get resentful of I guess what I see as unnecessary traps that one can fall in but that's that's where that paradox comes in again because often these wounds that we're experiencing are actually the windows right these are the gifts that take us to that well, next layer of growth or Exactly. And, and that's, that's a real tough one for psychology to resolve. You know, I don't know if we'll ever resolve it, but, but that question of do we need, actually need to be shocked or jarred in some way in order to go to the next level of consciousness, you know, or a deepening, a broadening of consciousness, is some kind of shaking of the foundations necessary? I don't think there's a dogmatic answer to that, but certainly we've seen uh, that that has been an impetus for many people who feel vital about their lives uh, because it's it's taken them out of the box and and it's it's uh, in some ways uh, mobilized them to live differently to find a different way so anyway going back to that uh, attempting to uh, tune in to the awesomeness of life uh, to being being aware of passing nature of time even right now if I tune into that it makes even our connection right now that much more precious, realizing that it's all passing, it's all fleeting. And yet it's here right now. We're here. And that is awe-inspiring, really. Absolutely. I feel like when we're talking about depth existential psychotherapy, I mean, the, the word seems very, it's a mouthful. But really, it's also about um, bringing that depth-oriented uh, perspective into our into our everyday. That this is something that we can actually live yes. every day and every moment. Um, so yes. m- maybe we can talk about how, like how can our listeners orient their life to become um, much more depth-oriented? <laughs> yeah, many possible routes. Uh, I, I was also uh, realizing that uh, another way that I found um, this cultivation of depth as, as very uh, uh, very valuable and, and, and very much a part of uh, every, my everyday life is in, in cross-cultural contact, too, and in... Um, I think this kind of awe-based attitude can be very important to bridge building among people of different backgrounds. Because so much of it is about coming to terms with the other in oneself, right? Uh, As well as the other, other. But the other, other brings us in touch with the other in ourselves as well. And so, to go to your question, uh, I, I think pra- practicing even uh, visualizations, and I sometimes work with students around this, of sitting with someone of a very different culture or background <clears throat> or uh, mindset than you, maybe your most challenging client or uh, someone you know that uh, makes your blood curdle even. I mean, to take this to the extreme, one of my mentors, Jim, Jim Bugenthal, used to talk about how uh, 
appalled he was by Hitler and Nazi Germany, but he, he often wondered if he could sit with Hitler as a psychotherapist and what that would bring up in him. And that can be an extremely powerful exercise. You know, can you sit with political leaders, religious leaders, who uh, totally repel you? What are the thoughts, feel, especially feelings, body sensations that come up, associations to those images, maybe memories? What happens when you sit with those and stay as present as you can to them? And then maybe imagine that other person talking to you, um, telling you about their lives and their story. Uh, I think one often finds that as difficult as it is to do that, or even to think about it, that there's a kind of humanizing that can take place whereby uh, it's not, not about agreeing with or even necessarily you know, supporting the other as much as attempting to understand being in a mode of discovery. And I would say that when that happens in actuality, person to person, beyond the practicing of the visualization, uh, many more times than not, people find a different relation to the other, both in themselves and the other person, and they're actually sitting with them. And so we've been promoting and cultivating some of these living room dialogues, actually, uh, I'm, I'm, I joined a group called Better Angels, named after Lincoln's famous speech of the better angels of our nature, you know, to bring the union back, uh, where it's a grassroots movement that is now in 31 states, and uh, they've done over a thousand workshops, where you have a group of liberals and conservatives, usually Republicans and Democrats, who come together, willing to come together, and in a very structured way, talk about their experiences. Uh, but a lot of it is, it, it, it is really all geared toward uh, attempting to understand and learn about the other, not to change the other. And the credo is uh, respect, curiosity and openness. Those are the pivot points. So the, the facilitators really try to keep people in that mode and avoiding the you know, gotcha questions or uh, <laughs> accusations or uh, knee-jerk stereotypes. All of that is bracketed back as much as it can. And it's people honestly attempting to, to learn about each other just as a basis. And then from there, it's interesting what people find. They, they usually discover something new that tempers their sense of one another somewhat. Now, will that, you know, revolutionize America, uh, the world? I don't know, but it seems to me that it's one of the best, most powerful uh, ways of creating at least the conditions for substantive change and more uh, communalism. I think I, at, I, yeah, go ahead. at the heart of what you're saying is really um, conversations without the ego, uh, which is not a very easy thing to do, but is yeah. really truly transformative, which again takes us back to the therapy room. And when yes. you were talking about the cross-cultural aspect of things. I mean, I'm thinking about um, psychotherapy as a practice that has been um, dom like mostly a, w a white um, uh, mm. practice. And, yeah. and, and now we're moving like, like the world, we're all, we're all suffering from the same thing. It doesn't matter where we come from. And so 
I see therapy as a tool that's going to be much more important in the coming years, and and that it ne- it's it's not a I don't think it's just a white practice. I think it's a human. Oh, <laughs> yeah. A number of us old white guys are trying to change. <laughs> because it, the thing is, because like even from my own immediate circle, a lot of people were resisting. Like, are are you really getting help with psychotherapy? Is it really helping you? Actually, yes. If if we're open to it, yeah. Well, we we really need the infusion of of multiculturalism to inform our existential therapy. Yes. Because after all, what is is existentialism or humanism all about? It's about human lives, Absolutely. human existence. It's not about white man's existence or, or this class's existence. And I, I felt for such a long time that, that the riches of this approach need to be opened up. The box needs to be opened up for, for everyone because this is a human project. Absolutely. The human project, how do we, re- what is our relationship to life as a whole, to existence as a whole? We're all in that, as you say. Uh, you know, we're all vulnerable, fragile, small beings before this vastness, and at the same time have this tremendous capacity to take risks, to venture out, to learn, to discover, create, um, how do we all work with that and create conditions where that becomes a more appealing road (laughs) for everyone, you know? So these are, I see a lot of these uh, modes, including the existential depth therapy modes as experiments. In many ways, they're experiments in, in living, and they're they're very uh, very precious uh, because they're just not encouraged in most mainstream cultures, as far as I know. Uh, and especially with technology now, it's a whole other overlay that I think is making it even more challenging. Mm-hmm. And that's why I've been thinking and writing a, a lot about the challenges of the robotic revolution, which uh, is, seems to be more and more about the quick fix, uh, the machine model for living, you know, speed, instant results, appearance and packaging, the interior life could easily get lost and the capacity to pause. That's why I think it's so wonderful you're in that union depth therapy. You're cultivating that capacity to be more fully present with yourself. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. In, 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 in terms of, uh, like you just mentioned, the the AI revolution, you know, with technology, we're all vulnerable to massive disruption. And it seems like we're inching closer and closer as, you know, these, these technologies are becoming ubiquitous. Um, I'm reminded of uh, author Yuval Harari, you know, he talks about the struggle against irrelevance, you know, what will happen the day when most human jobs are easily replaced by artificial general intelligence. And so, these existential questions aren't just for the privileged who have lots of time to ponder, you know, the big questions. They will become at the forefront, I think, of, of every human being. Yeah, they're, they're coming very quickly. And actually, there are people who call themselves transhumanists who actually desire to see the human being as we know it irrelevant because they think that uh, life will be so much more efficient once it's it's mechanized and once you know we're able to download data through i guess neural chips and um we'll be virtually impervious to disease because we will become cyborgs basically and this this is seen as desirable post-humanism transhumanism it's called i i think there's no question that there is a a thrust in that direction. And we, especially in our our depth existential communities, need to be very tuned in to this problem 
because the whole definition of what it means to be a human being is, is changing rapidly. And so it raises questions about what parts do we want to preserve of this old humanity? What parts are we willing, again, are we willing yes. to shape differently? And I think we have to be careful on both ends, not to be dogmatic on, on either end, because uh, I, I try not to be a Luddite either. I mean, I do believe technology has done some amazing things. and It's it's done some great things for, for many of us. Uh, think about medicine and science in particular, improved our lives. But we need to be circumspect about it. And at all costs, I believe, we need to preserve the capacity for presence because that will be our, our guidance system to be able to pause and to discern, okay, is this really the direction we want to go? And again, not just because my cognition tells me or some abstract you know, book told me or philosophy, but because uh, my whole bodily being is questioning this particular direction, a replacement of a, let's say, a physical part of ourselves, or my whole bodily being can go on board with it, uh, willing to take the leap. Boy, I mean, th these are going to be really naughty questions. We're on the cusp of facing that now. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, and and that's why we're seeing there's a sort of meditation has become this, you know, buzzword now for a while. It's for a reason. Yes, that's true. That's true. And yeah, I, I think uh, there there's there's a great value to this mindfulness revolution that we're seeing. Um, I also think that it it can be. It can become, in some sense, uh, a technology in itself if it's not if it's not about life, you know, if it's not a, where the rubber hits the road about your everyday living and everyday consciousness. If it's just, let's say, in a cubicle <laughs> like a yoga studio or uh, or one retreat or you know, kind of compartmentalized. And it's not a, a, a lifetime cultivation. Um, and if it doesn't allow one to engage, you know, the, the anxious and the, the tragic dimensions of living, too, as well as... Uh, that which connects us to something higher or, or larger, uh, it could end up bypassing important areas of life that I think existential folks have kept us kind of on, on path with, to keep reminding us. Grounding us. Of the, yeah, grounding us, of the, the messiness of life, too, and that, that that's a part of it. Yeah, I would say put it as helping us to find ground within groundlessness. Mm -hmm. but, but to be aware that uh, we, we are in suspense, both literally and figuratively. And yet, there's so much of that suspense that uh, we can be conscious to, you know, conscious about and that can be freeing yeah and um, i'm just thinking about and just in closing i'm just thinking about um uh, something that adrian had mentioned to me just before talking to you maybe you want to talk about it about maslow and and peak experiences yeah i i was reminded by i think it was an article i read a few years ago um about how actually towards the end of his life you know some of this never got published but how Maslow actually, he's, he's quite well known for his work on peak experience. And he started referring to experiencing those qualities of the peak, um, 
the peak quality in the ordinary. So it's finding it in the mundane and the ordinary. And this was after I think he had a near death experience that might have actually created some of that perceptual change. Um, is there anything that you could maybe add to that? Because you mentioned he was a big influence in your life and, and here you are actually in the depths of that same lineage of, of work um, is how we can integrate the peak within the ordinary mundane world. Especially since he's just known for the, you know, for that triangle, <laughs> but there's much more to his work. Right. The, the, uh, <laughs> the satisfaction of, of needs and yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> self-actualization triangle. Right. right. Yes, that one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, I've, I've always appreciated his notion of peak experience. And uh, I, I like his direction of seeing the extraordinary and the ordinary. And of course, he's not the only one who's who's uh, looked in that way. Uh, we've had many poets and humanists through history who've opened to that, seen the power in, in that. Uh, I guess one of my concerns with peak experience is that it could be seen as a kind of fleeting high sort of a quick high. I, I distinguish between what I call the, the quick boil version of awe and the slow simmer. And by awe, by the way, I mean the, the humility and wonder or sense of adventure toward living. Um, so I, I think we've, we've got a fair amount of the quick boil, <laughs> um, but we really need to work on more of that lifetime cultivation and the more complex sense of of the awesome uh, that includes uh, you know, sorrow and anxiety, and some of the, the real difficult parts of life as well. That's that's a part of what intensifies. Uh, uh, real living, in my view. Um, but how to cultivate the extraordinary and the ordinary? Uh, again, I it, I believe it's to practice, and it's a lot about uh, what you notice. You know, taking time to notice. The details, let's say, of another person, the subtleties of your interaction with, with someone else, maybe their, their story, and noticing, the, discovering the details of their story, the many layers, all the different influences that go into them becoming them. Um, from a macro perspective, it's being able to uh, see the, the how we're all connected to something larger than ourselves, um, participating in this this great journey of you know the the Earth whirling around the sun at sixty seven thousand miles per hour and the uh, the, the solar system or the galaxy apparently moving through the universe at 1.2 million miles per hour. We're all part of this, this spaceship. And if we can kind of get that attunement at points, we're in touch with, uh, with that bigger picture that can be so gratifying. Uh, I, I call a number of of these uh, ways of cultivating awe, lenses of awe. I don't know if you've seen descriptions of that, but uh, if one could uh, attempt to engage or sharpen one's awareness, like almost like picking up lenses and seeing through the lens of the passing nature of time and life, for example, we're seeing through the lens of wonder and surprise. Can you be open at, at this very moment for something different to happen? Uh, something 
that you discover? Can you allow yourself to be surprised? Even though you're going to that same old class or you're reading that same old book or you're seeing that same old person, it's so easy for us to get into these slots, right? Well, it doesn't have to be the same old, same old. Depending on our attitude, our approach, something something fresh can happen. And you can bring that something fresh. You can help to bring that something fresh to the moment, too. Um, can you see through the lens of, again, how we're connected to something so much more in the moment? Just think about the histories and mysteries that we all bring right now. There's so much we could explore about each other. You know? uh, and uh, also the, the amazement of what brings us here, how, how we're all children of, of the cosmos, just dropped in. And does that shift our view of ourselves? I think it sheds a lot of the usual categories of, just seeing clothing or, you know, certain look or what have you. Uh, being able to pick up the lens of what I call sentiment. Can you tune into your emotionality when you're seeing someone else or connecting with something or someone or a place? Travel can be a great part of this, too. But can you, can you engage that something again with uh, more of your whole bodily being? And especially how, how you're feeling. Can you open to your feeling when you're with that person or thing? Uh, the capacity to be alone, the lens of solitude. I think that's really big. It's bigger than we have granted in our culture uh, because so much has has cut against being alone. We're so tethered, you know, often to our iPads or iPhones. Uh, we always have to have stimulation. But how do you help to create or co-create a sense of awe unless there's some capacity to bear feelings, to bear parts of ourselves that are unsettling um, yeah in our I, I just feel the need to also mention here we are talking and technology is actually mediating our encounter with you <laughs> and so again without being dogmatic I think it's it's beautiful that we can see how these things can actually live together you know we're both sitting here you're you're in California and we're in Canada and yet right. there's a transmission here, right? Our bodies experience things in this conversation that... Even energetically, I can feel it. Technology yeah, enabled. Sure. Yeah. Um, but just disproved my whole thesis. <laughs> <laughs> here we are, yeah. I mean, just... No, it's, it's, a, it's a great irony, and it, it's, it's why we need to be careful about being dogmatic. I think uh, a lot of questions can be raised about whether there are significant differences between coming across on the screen and actually living and breathing with each other in person. I would, I would uh, advocate that there, there are, but, uh, but I think all these things need to be explored much more. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I recently done a series of lectures to China, Chinese students too, and I, it's mind-blowing, mm -hmm. you know, these thousands of miles and thousands of miles of cultural difference, too. There's some bridges being created and, and actual, as you say, energy exchanges mm -hmm. that I, I felt. I couldn't see all the students, but I saw some of them on the screen. And uh, what do we do with that? <laughs> So you're right. That is part of the awesomeness, too, or can be. I think the problem is comes in uh, when things are overly programmed, when they're preset, uh, when, uh, you know, they've got an algorithm or uh, when it's a calculative mode, let's say, as Heidegger put it, calculated versus meditative, uh, it closes off. And when you close off what can be 
discovered and what can happen also, you're sanitizing to some degree and, and you're dulling the potential for radical awe, you know, for uh, our fuller relationship to the mystery of being. And I think that's the danger. So how do we be careful about closing off our ways of interacting and communicating in laboratory-like settings uh, that, that don't permit greater possibility? Yeah. Kirk, that's wonderful. Yeah, let's let's bring this to an end here. I'm just mindful of your time, um, but I do want to. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Your belly bellowed unsung shame. Flashes of love and courage are only but apparitions, nightly visitations that dissipate come dawn. Then there is tyrannical fear under the hot scorch of the sun, interlaced with deep lies that we like to tell ourselves. We are lunar creatures. There are many things that I wanted to say to you, like how I loved you deeply and simply. But with every glass of wine, you methodically removed the pain of living and loving. Baby, didn't I tell you that Rumi says the wound is where the light enters you? But you did not like my foolish ways. You're always up there, you said with your stained tongue. I showed you my tears, yes. I showed you my wetness. I'm coming down, baby, I'm coming down. I showed you everything, but you did not come up for me. enjoyed this episode. Next week, we journey into Laura's story of working with the psychedelic plant medicine, ayahuasca. You can find links and show notes at soulspacepodcast.com. And please support our work by leaving us a review on iTunes. You can follow us on social at soulspacepod, that's soulspacepod. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Until next time. Mm-hmm.